Steve Baker, welcome to Acting Prime Minister and thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me on. I'm absolutely delighted to have this opportunity to drop myself in trouble. <laughs> and I can see you're in your Commons office at the moment with all your staff probably listening into everything you say as well. Absolutely. There are no secrets from my staff, of course. <laughs> I wasn't sure what you'd say to doing this over Zoom, actually, because you have been quite outspoken lately about the restrictions in terms of COVID-19. I mean, we'll get onto that later, but you're, you're obviously doing quite a bit over Zoom. Yeah, of course. Well, you know, I am a software engineer. I'm quite comfortable with using technology and uh, do, using Zoom does seem to be a fantastic innovation. And of course, I don't mind. OK, well, look, let's waste no more time in getting you settled into number 10 as Prime Minister. Great news. <laughs> and we always like to, to ask people a couple of questions just to get it going, just to make you feel at home. So firstly, what do you think is the item that you would, uh, would take with you into Downing Street, the personal item that you take from home? My Yamaha MT-10. It's an absolutely uh, stupendous hooligan motorcycle, and so it would look absolutely appropriate for the Prime Minister parked up outside the door. When I was reading up on you um, for this podcast, actually, there are a lot of hobbies that you have, motorcycles being one. Um, skydiving, I think, was another one. That's right. Yeah, I used to do fast catamaran sailing. I, I like to go fast. I used to ride my, what did I have at the time? I had a BMW R 1200 GS, which I used to ride to work at uh, Dexu, which meant riding up Downing Street. And that seemed to cause some amusement. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine there are many, many MPs who ride on a motorcycle there. No. And actually, I know a stunt motorcyclist from my skydiving. And unfortunately, he's a bit short. But what we were planning was that we would do a stunt whereby uh, it seemed to be me riding up into Downing Street, but actually it was him. And he could have <laughs> stunt ridden up all, all up and down da Downing Street. So if I were Prime Minister, I think it would be the Yamaha MT-10 plus get the stunt rider to do some stunts up and down Downing Street. Just make sure you got my camera on standby for that one. Um, <laughs> what's the drink that you think you'd pour yourself once you're kind of working through your red box late at night? It would probably be a KTM racing team uh, cup of tea. Excellent. Lovely mug there. Um, and who's the first person you'd call as Prime Minister? Archbishop of Canterbury. Ah, interesting. Okay. Because you are a committed Christian. I am, yes. Honestly, we could just do with the day of prayer. I think we're in a lot of trouble right now, and I think we need all the help we can get. So I probably would call the Archbishop of Canterbury and say, let's have a day of prayer. Not that, you know, I wouldn't want to force it on anybody and, you know, let other faiths do things their own way. But, uh, yeah, we're in a pickle. And um, I think that it's a good idea for people to co-opt all the help we can get. OK, well, look, we've touched on your background already, but let's go into your, your path to power in a bit more detail now. You were born to working class parents in Cornwall. Um, going to the local comprehensive school and getting baptised as a teenager to become a, a committed Christian, as I say. After school, you joined the RAF as an engineer, working your way up before retiring from the forces and studying a master's in computer science at Oxford University. You went on to become a software consultant and then in 2010 an MP for Wickham in Buckinghamshire. And since then, I'm sure many people will know you've had a long spell as chair of the European Research Group. Uh, you've been a Brexit minister before resigning from Theresa May's government and and ultimately helping to remove her as prime minister too. So you've been pretty you've been pretty high profile the past few years. I can see you taking a bit of a gulp there. Um, what? But who would you say is the real Steve Baker if you were describing yourself and your politics and what you really care about? How would you describe yourself? The real Steve Baker. Um, well, I care about other people. I mean, I'm under a command to care about other people without wishing to overemphasize it. But, you know, I was very honoured to win the Civility and Politics Politician of the Year Award. Well, why did I win that award? Well, it's because I always try to see the other person's point of view. And the reason why I try to see the other person's point of view is the obvious one that I'm under a command to do that. So I suppose... I suppose the real Steve Baker is the one who strives after freedom, strives to see other people's point of view, um, tries to do what is right for all that we get criticised. Um, but actually, I'm quite a quiet and introverted person. Um, I mean, I left the Air Force age 28. I did, in a sense, retire. I did formally retire, but I retired early. The RAF wanted me to do aero engines for the rest of my career, and I wanted to get involved in a dot-com boom, uh, hence an MSc in software. Uh, I worked for a startup and then I worked on and off with them in different capacities uh, for, for what, eight or nine years. Um, and then I was just so fed up with politics, I thought, emigrate, moan or stand. I decided to stand. And two years later, I was two and a half years later, I was elected. So um, I could never have imagined that I would be here with you today. 
uh, 12 years ago when I decided to get into politics. I had no prior political experience and it, I can assure, assure you no one's more surprised than me that I seem to have some modest ability to achieve things in politics. So it's a strange life. And since then, Brexit has sort of defined you as an MP. Are you, are you comfortable with that? Is that OK with you? Are you quite happy to be defined um, by Brexit? Not really. Um, I mean, freedom is what defines me. So what is liberty? It's self-government, no more, no less. There was some philosopher who said that once upon a time. So I was very pro-EU for a long time. I used to drive my wife crazy. I was pro a federal Europe. I was pro the, the euro and the Lisbon Treaty. I can't believe you were pro the euro. Yeah, I hadn't read as much monetary theory then. <laughs> <laughs> but I... Um, yeah, I was just because I like Europe and I like other people and I'm a classical liberal in my outlook and the classical liberal things about the EU are good things. You know, free movement of people and goods and services. You know, the, the, the European dream is a good one. Why wouldn't you support it? it and the, the answer is if you look at it closely and, you know, off goes the conversation. So I'm not especially happy to be defined by Brexit. I think that it's been an awful time in our history. I think I don't regret what I've done uh, because we're leaving the EU to a future that I think we need to have, one which will flatten the structure of power all around the world. Ask me about it, I'll tell you what I think. Um, but no, I, I, I mean, the first thing I did when I got into politics was go and give quite a lot of time to the Centre for Social Justice as a it's effectively a management consultant, trying to help them work out how their policies would be rolled out in government. And I really enjoyed it. I was really furious at the, at the welfare state for failing the poorest. You know, if you divide total welfare spending by the number of households in the UK, I think it's about twelve, thirteen thousand pounds a year last time I checked. Well, there ought not to be any poverty if that money was just targeted at poor people. So I, I'm furious that we spend so much money and yet have so much poverty and suffering. So so I'm a classical liberal whose heart is to lift the poor out of poverty. And that is really what I'd like to be known for. Uh, but unfortunately, um, circumstances have conspired against me and I'm known for being the rebel commander, which isn't really where I wanted to be. And do you find that people come up to you in the street and because people sort of have an idea about who you are and, and probably have a strong view on you either way, just because you're associated with Brexit? Yes, they do. I mean, in strange places, too. I mean, I went up to Manchester and um, it was weird. I, I spoke at a dinner at Manchester. A few people saw me in the street and there was a moment when I was leaving. I was going up the escalators into Manchester sta Station. And just as I was coming, going up, came down the escalator, came Bill Nye, the actor. And there was this weird moment. I'd love to meet him and find out if he shared the moment. But I felt that I recognised him and he recognised me. We didn't speak. We just had that knowing nod like you and I might have if we were too far away to speak to one another. And I thought this is a strange thing that I'm now recognised by actors I, I recognise. But uh, yeah, people do come up to me and shake my hand. Uh, but equally, some people will shut the door in my face who previously would have voted Conservative. I've had people absolutely quake with rage at me on the street and that I very much regret. I'll never forget one chap in particular. Um, I mean, quaking with rage. Um, but many of the things which were said were not best said by, by me and they're the things which have made people angry. And I, I want our country to be, to be healed from all this. Do you regret that it got so divisive then? Because it was such a divisive year last year, wasn't it, over Brexit? Of course I do, yes. Um, I deeply regret that not a number of divisions, and this is why I've started calling for radical moderation. Because on too many subjects, we're hearing from the hysterical people on both sides. And, it, you know, it, it'll be the environment with Extinction Rebellion or it will be race with BLM. Um, and, uh, you know, one way or another on, on one subject or the economy or coronavirus, we, like coronavirus, we've ended up with either unjustified complacency about what is a dangerous disease for, for people vulnerable to it versus absolute terror amongst people who actually uh, would find probably that it was a moderate to mild disease because they're younger with no pre-existing conditions. And, and I'm really worried that our society is polarizing with hysterical arguments on both sides. So what I'm, I'm saying is I want us to have a radical spirit of concern for one another, a radical willingness to listen to one another, and then be moderate in what we say and do to try and close all these, all these divides. Because it's interesting actually talking to you, Steve, because you are one of the few MPs who has a really clear idea actually of what they believe in. 
I'm not suggesting that lots of MPs are, are cynical creatures who come into politics just to kind of, you know... <laughs> Far be it from you to say that. No, and actually, I, that's not what I believe. I, I, yeah. A lot of journalists uh, uh, may end up suggesting that about MPs, but I'm not one of those journalists. I, I, I don't believe in that cynicism. I don't think it does anything for democracy. But, you know, I do talk to lots of MPs who perhaps come into politics because they have an idea that they want to do something helpful, and then that idea sort of develops over time. Whereas I feel as if actually you've had quite a clear idea of what your politics are, um, I mean, you set up um, a think tank, the Cobden Centre, which is all about being a libertarian, um, about promoting liberty. I don't like the word libertarian. I like to say you not? classical liberal. Libertarian's got too many hard edges. I mean, if people really want to label my politics, I am a Christian libertarian, which is a combination likely to alienate everyone in the room one way or another. But, you know, I'm an old English classical liberal, which is why Cobden, you know, Toby Baxendale and I set it up. It's honest money, free trade and peace. I mean, I think we're in the midst of a profound crisis of political economy, even prior to the coronavirus crisis. I think for the whole of our lifetimes, we've been paying for big government ultimately by debasing the currency. And that creates all sorts of side effects, which lead to injustice. So that's why we started the Cobden Centre. I, I think this is a really major crisis. The global financial crisis, I think, was one of the was the first major earthquake moment in a really profound crisis of the way we live. We've cast all our cares on the state, which means someone else will pay for us, and we've forgotten to care about one another. So I love cooperatives and mutuals because they embody the spirit of individuals choosing to care about others, and that's virtuous. Instead, what we've done is we've cast all our cares and responsibilities on the state, which is an instrument of coercion and control. There's no escaping it. And that just means you, you end up, you pay a lot of taxes and then you don't get any of the services you need, whether you're rich or poor. So, and, and we can't afford to pay for it. So, you know, discuss. I could talk about this for, an, for at least an hour. Uh, so I, I think we need to change the way that we live. And that change means learning to care about one another and, to, to, and for that care not to be just merely about screaming on Twitter, but to be embodied in things like mutuals. And do you think that's the case then, that we have, we have become too reliant on the state and not reliant enough on our on ourselves. Well, it's it's. I believe in us being reliant on one another. So there's a wonderful phrase by one of the, my Austrian philosophers that I like: um, "Society is cooperation; it is community in action." So this thing we call society is relationships. It was terrible. Margaret Thatcher should have said society is intangible, but of course, in the course of things, she said there's no such thing. But what she meant was society is intangible. Society is relationships between people. And everyone understands that healthy relationships are voluntary. Yeah, but what the state does is not voluntary relationships. You can see it in this coronavirus crisis. What the state imposes is compulsory relationships. So what I want is society, but what I want is voluntarism. And this is a tricky thing for the state to deliver. But what I think has gone wrong is that from the 1911 National Insurance Act, we have progressively stamped out voluntary action. There was a wonderful quote, which I often use to finish speeches, and I'm not sure I'll be able to remember it now, but I'll give it a go. But it was in the Odd Fellows Friendly Society magazine at the eve of the 1911 National Insurance Act. And remember, at the time, friendly societies were providing wel uh, welfare and health care. But the quote was something like this. Working people are awakening to the fact that this is an attempt to take from the class to which they belong the governance of the great voluntary institutions which they have built up for themselves and to hand them over to the paid servants of the governing class. This is not the development of liberty. This is not the development of self-government, but a new form of autocracy and tyranny, not the less but more dangerous for its benevolent intent. And that quote from 1911 in Oddfellow's Friendly Society magazine, that is who I am and what I stand for normal people caring enough about one another to set up institutions they can govern themselves to reconnect the cost of providing for one another with all the other incentives that we face because at the moment what's happening is we've ended up that universal credit's not generous enough but it's sufficiently generous that we can't really afford it and other working people who struggle to get by object to its level and this can't possibly be right somehow we need to reconnect people so they've got a heart for one another and they want benefits to be high enough you can live on them, but only for so long. They are beverage principle. They're basically, so you're responsible and you live on them for so long as you need to. Anyway, I, I've given you an extremely long answer there. No, but it's very relevant at the moment because obviously the size of the state, the, the level of intervention from the state is hugely topical in terms of COVID-19. It's something yeah. you've been debating in Parliament. Um, if you were Prime Minister, 
what is it you think he would do differently in terms of the level of state intervention we're seeing at the moment? Well, so so I like, I'd like to say I'd be radically moderate. So we've got a manifesto. We'd have to deliver that manifesto. So we can't be crazy. We can't unwind 100 years suddenly. There's no question of doing that. We've got to be pragmatic. So I'm an engineer. An engineer, aerospace engineer, you would expect me to have a very clear idea of how aeroplanes fly, but then to be very pragmatic in what I do. And that is what I would do in parliament, in, in politics, if, if I were in number 10. So and in I terms of COVID-19 the, specifically then? what? In terms of COVID-19 specifically, I would implement what is called the Great Barrington Declaration. So I've been tweeting about this today. Um, it's a declaration, it's a, title is, a subtitle is this, as infectious disease epidemiologists and public health scientists, we have grave concerns about the damaging physical and mental health impacts of the prevailing COVID-19 policies and recommend an approach we call focused protection. And they, des they, they describe it on this declaration. It's currently signed, I need to refresh that because that's not the right number. It's signed by, I think, a couple of, yeah, 2,714 medical and public health scientists have signed it, 3,576 medical practitioners and over 56,000 members of the public, including me. So what, what this does is say, let, let's protect the vulnerable. Let's take reasonable precautions to slow the spread of the virus in those for those for whom it's not uh, an especially dangerous disease. But we have to get back to living lives without fear. Uh, and so that's what I would do. Do you think then, talking about it in very practical terms, some of the restrictions need to be lifted now? Well, this is an incredibly difficult thing to say in the context of rising case numbers and indeed uh, rising hospitalizations. But I said to somebody yesterday who's proposing a zero COVID strategy, I said, yeah, the problem with your, your strategy is we could destroy the currency. I mean, look at what I think it was Kate Nichols said to the Treasury Committee yesterday. She's described these restrictions as devastating to the hospitality industry. But we're going to end up coming out of this crisis and finding that we've got nothing to spend our funny money on. You know, we're, we're, the Bank of England's, for want of a better term, printing more money than the government is borrowing, and the government's borrowing a vast amount. I mean, it's 745 billion of QE we're heading towards. Sooner or later, this will be a problem. So. It, when you look in the round at the non-COVID health costs, mental health, stroke, heart conditions, you know, people putting off getting the care that they need, all the trouble that's storing up, you look at you know, people falling apart because they can't socialise. Even with rising case numbers, um, I, I think we have to be courageous and shield and protect the people who are vulnerable with a relentless focus on their care, their well-being. And then people, frankly, like you and me, for whom the disease might be might be very uncomfortable, like about a flu, a bit worse, but you know, actually, we're overwhelmingly likely to survive it. You know, it is the the the, the infection fatality rate for people who are healthy and young is very very low. And what we have to do is have had the disease, so that we build up a population immunity, so that those who are vulnerable to it are able to reemerge into society. And that's the essence of this Great Barrington Declaration. I hope people will look at it, but. I have to say, at the moment, what are the alternatives? At the moment, the government's saying they're going to suppress the, vi vac suppress the virus until a vaccine is available. What if there's no vaccine? What if when a vaccine comes, it isn't the miracle cure we were hoping for? All it does is make the disease more survivable in the vulnerable, and we still need some plan B. Well, in either event, we're going to need a plan B, and that this Great Barrington Declaration is that plan B. But the, the danger we're in at the moment is we'll destroy our economy. And I mean destroy. If inflation comes in, the Bank of England have been clear with the Treasury Committee that they will have to take steps to deal with inflation. That is their remit. So in other words, they'll, in putting it in my own words, they'll pull the plug on government spending. They've made it clear that it's not their job to fund government. So if inflation comes in, they'll pull the plug on government spending, and that will create mayhem for everybody. So this is a very precarious set of circumstances, and I believe the way out of it is to adopt this solution signed by thousands of professionals to get our economy going again, so that through social cooperation in society, we're better able to support one another voluntarily. The suggestion is that the Prime Minister is looking again at more restrictions at the moment rather than less. So how would you feel if he introduced more restrictions this week or, or next week? What do you think that would do to the country? 
well, it, I think that the, there are increasing numbers of people in a position to know saying that the costs of lockdown are worse than the costs of the disease. So I think it would be a very, it would have a very severe impact on the, the country and for the long term. But if the, the, I think the problem the prime minister has is he is betting, he's betting the country on a vaccine turning up and solving all these problems. And that is the essential question: Will it come? And um, I'm listening to, for example, Dr. Ben Spencer, MP, telling us that a vaccine won't come, or if it does come, it won't do everything people hope. So I think that there is a grave danger. We're jumping into a lobster pot here from which we can't emerge. We need to emerge. And the people who are kind of feeling the restrictions most at the moment, of course, are in the north of England, which is where lots of Conservatives managed to win seats from Labour at the last election. Are you worried that there might be a bit of a backlash there from people who feel as though they are being treated more harshly than than those in the South, even if when you look at the case numbers, you can kind of understand why. Yeah, so I'm very clear that this is one nation and that we can't leave any part of it behind. But that means we can't leave any part of it behind in all regards. So we can't let the virus rip anywhere, nor can we allow the economy to collapse anywhere. So uh, I'll be speaking in the debate later on the Northeast and the Northwest, uh, making some of those points. Um, But this isn't really, this is beyond politics now. This is about real people and their lives and their prospects and whether they've got anything to look forward to. And what about this 10pm curfew? Because there's a lot of concern that that's not really working and there'll probably be a vote on it next week. Have you you worked out yet how you're going to vote on it? Uh, I shall oppose it, yes. It appears to be badly justified in evidence and insofar as it does work, listen to Kate Nichols talking about the hospitality industry. It works because it's wrecking the hospitality industry, which we only just pumped lots of taxpayers' money into through out to help out. So, for example, you can't have a second cover, a second second group going through a table if you have to turf people out at 10. So I expect to vote against it because it's badly evidenced and appears to be... Uh, um, counterproductive but quite honestly right now once i've done this podcast i've got another podcast to do sorry uh, but then i'm going to go off air and i'm going to encu- encourage other colleagues off air for a week for a few days to give the government space to revise what they're doing and i, I hope they will revise the policy i mean it's interesting because this does all tie into liberalism or libertarianism i'm sorry to use that term um yeah. Because actually, if you look at someone like John Stuart Mill and his harm principle, who's I'm sure someone that you've studied too, yeah. the whole point of the harm principle is that liberty is, is all well and good and should absolutely be championed until the point at which it harms somebody else. Yes. And COVID-19 is the perfect example of that, isn't it? I mean, yes. Is it, is it not right that we do curb our liberties in order to avoid spreading the virus to somebody else? Yes, it is right that we curb our liberties. The question is whether the curbs are proportionate and doing good. That's, and, this, this, and I explain this as a politics home article out there. Somebody had said the government had no right to force us to wear masks. And I made exactly the argument you've just put to me, that the harm principle means that the government does have a right to say to us, wear a mask for the protection of others. So I absolutely agree it's legitimate. The question is proportionality and benefit. And at the moment, the, it appears that the evidence is that lockdown does more harm than good. Well, you know, the harm principle does cut both ways. If lockdown is harming people by giving more people cancer from which they won't recover, ruining more people's mental health, health taking away people's career prospects by ruining their education, well, then we need to do the minimum of harm. And that might mean changing the arrangements under which we live regarding COVID. What do you make of President Trump? Wandering well, back in to the, the round. Uh... <laughs> Heading back to the White House without a mask the other day, or taking the mask off at least when he got to the balcony. I mean, in America right now, we're seeing this argument play out on steroids, aren't we? Well, quite literally, in Donald Trump's case, he has been on steroids. I'm afraid so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's even more uh, polarised. And you talk about radical moderation. It's even more polarised over there. Yeah. Particularly with an election coming up. So this is one of the reasons why I'm Taking a take every opportunity to say, let's be radically moderate, because I do not want the United Kingdom to go down the path of the United States in this regard, where everything's an existential struggle on just about any issue. It can't be the way we want to live. I mean, I think people want harmony in their lives. They want a degree of agreement. I mean, the two most common things you hear as a politician are, um, you're all the same, and why can't you work together? These two things are, these two things are not compatible. But somewhere in the midst of this, we need to work together on matters of obvious national uh, interest, uh, where, where, where there's com- common ground, but have distinctively different ideas from which the public can choose. But we, we shouldn't 
we shouldn't be hysterical. I mean, there's too much alarmism in too many directions. Um, I could talk, give you any number of examples, but I, I, I do not want to go down the road of the politics of the United States uh, because it, it, can't, it creates an atmosphere within which people are afraid and fear is not a virtue, courage is a virtue and uh, courage and hope and justice uh, and faith and love and you know the people know what the virtues are and that's the kind of society i want to live in and i think what's playing out in the usa at the moment doesn't doesn't encourage those virtues so i want us to take a different path in the uk and we are a world away from where we were in december where boris johnson had just won a landslide election which whether you love Boris or whether you hate Boris Johnson, that was supposed to be a moment of kind of national healing. He'd, he'd got this convincing majority. The Brexit question was settled. We were moving on as a nation. Yeah. How do you feel he's doing now after nine months? In It's an in extremely government? difficult job that he has to do. And I, I am a Boris supporter. You know, I, I want him to succeed. But you know, I am in a position where I think that if the go- if his strategy is based on a vaccine coming, I think there's going to be a problem. So I'm doing what I'm doing to try and uh, show an alternative path. But no one should make any mistake. I'm a Boris supporter. But Boris has always needed the right team around him. I don't, you know, it, I don't think he would mind me saying that we didn't make him prime minister for his uh, meticulous grasp of tedious uh, administrative detail. We made him prime minister for his charisma and vision. And what's required is an environment around Boris that makes the most of his charisma and his vision, while other people take care of the tedious details. And, and when I say tedious, that doesn't mean they're unimportant. They're extremely important. They're the foundation of our life. But you know, what we need to do is make sure he gets all the help that we can give him. Uh, and unfortunately, the way that politics works, I've had to make a bit of a fuss in the newspapers and in the House of Commons uh, with my colleagues. But that, that's just democratic politics, I'm afraid. But I am a Boris supporter. I want him to succeed. Because what you're saying is you don't think he's getting particularly good advice from his advisors, really. Well, I don't want to. I've said enough about advisors. Most of his advisors, I uh, think, are wonderful people and very, very clever and talented. And they have my support and admiration. Except for Dominic Cummings. <laughs> I, I've said enough about him. <laughs> um, do you think Bojo's got his mojo still? There was definite mojo in his speech, yeah, definite mojo, yes, definitely there was. I don't want to be accused of sedition by saying anything else, but yeah, there was definite mojo there. He was funny. Uh, you know, Look, he, still, he loves this country and we still love him. There, there's no doubt in my mind. I remember having dinner with him once at Jacob Rees-Mogg's house. And again, I don't think either of them would mind me saying I was... Boris was on one end, Jacob on the other. I was sat next to Boris. And there was a moment of seriousness where he started talking about his love for our our country and the people within it. The same people who loved him at the general election and voted him in. And you could see the seriousness and the care and the compassion in, in him. And in that moment, I said, Boris, the country needs to see more of that side of you. And I think occasionally we get a glimpse. But that's what really works with Boris, his love for the actual people of the country, the ones we've got, not some utopian dream of a, a person we can create, but the actual people we've got. He loves them and they love him back. And what we need to do is help him get the policies which work so that that love for country, and I don't just mean the abstract, or you know, I don't mean that in a nationalistic way, I mean the love for the people of this country, can actually be seen to be his animating force. And then I think we will soar ahead. Okay, well, look, you're supposed to be Prime Minister at the moment, Steve, and we've forgotten about that. So we need to get back to that. And let's just talk about a couple more issues on your desk before we've got to let you go. And one is this sort of so-called culture war that seems to be being stoked at the moment by both sides. It seems to be something the government is quite willing to engage on, actually. Are you worried about this? Because, again, it comes back to your talk about radical moderation, doesn't it? Are you worried that we are becoming incredibly polarised on issues like... Black Lives Matter or trans rights, these kind of issues of our time that seem to be getting pretty nasty at times in the way that they're discussed. Yeah, things have got nasty. And I think it's because we have forgotten what it means to be tolerant. To be tolerant doesn't mean that we all approve of everybody's conduct, whatever it may be. That's not what tolerance means. Tolerance means two things. First, that you fundamentally disapprove of someone else's conduct. But second, you recognise it's not doing you any harm, so you let it go. That's what toler- That's what it means to tolerate something. And I'm afraid on all of these issues, on all of these issues, we, we've forgotten what it is to be a tolerant society. Let a thousand flowers bloom. You know, so religion would be the obvious one in the course of our history. You know, Jacob and I are both Christians. 
he's a Roman Catholic, I'm a Baptist. And we get on just fine because we, where we differ, differ on theology, it doesn't matter. But in the course of the life of our country, people have slaughtered one another over this. In fact, he, he wouldn't mind me saying he and I have joked that in the Civil War, we probably would have been on opposite sides. Um, but the point is life moves on. And that's really the point I'm making. There are issues which we have learned to live with. We recognize in the 21st century that theology is a disputable matter and that you can believe different things about your eternal salvation without it impacting on other people. So we just let it go. And, and I, I want us to just let a thousand flowers bloom on all the other things that don't harm each other. So that is interesting because, for example, you voted against same-sex marriage. So is that an issue now that you would be willing to let go and say, you know what, yeah, we've moved but on? I let, but so this is the thing. That, that was the most painful vote, bar none, ever in the tight 10 years I've been in politics, including war and peace and Brexit, because I ended up wounding people I didn't want to wound. What I said at the time of the same-sex marriage vote is that we should denationalise marriage, that the state should offer a single secular relationship called civil union, that's what I would call it, like South Africa does this apparently, and let anyone build their marriage on top. So that way, a, a liberal, there might be a liberal evangelical church that would have same-sex marriages, whereas there might be the Church of England not conducting them. But what you would do is you'd just tolerate that people were going different ways. So what I actually proposed was a genuinely tolerant system. And if people would listen to me, even at the time, mostly people would not along and say, that's fine. But I have gay married friends. I went to a gay marriage recently, and I was really, I was, I was full up that I was there and they were happy to have me there despite me voting against it because they know that I love them and I want, I wish the best for them and I will support them. And I was there to witness their marriage and to give them support. But, you know, I went to Las Vegas before I was elected with a gay married couple in California the years ago. And they, we haven't seen one another for a long time, but we had a great weekend. My wife and I were completely comfortable in, in their company. We had a brilliant time like, like friends do. So, you know, in hindsight, um, you know, Maybe just saying with this is the right thing to do would have been easy. But equally, remember, I represent a very socially conservative constituency. 17% of my electors are Asians. And that overwhelmingly means that they are Muslims. And, you know, I'm sure that there are liberal Muslims who are comfortable with same sex marriage, but there are many who are not. And the very clear expressed opinion in my constituency was against. So actually, for me to take that genuinely classically liberal view was quite progressive. So, but unfortunately, it takes this long to explain. But I haven't got a problem with same-sex marriage. Let a thousand flowers bloom, and as I say, people have got my love and support in their in their same-sex marriages, and I'm proud of it. There are a couple of other areas, though, where sort of religion comes into con conflict with other freedoms at the moment. Like uh, conversion therapy, for example, is something that Liz Truss is looking at, and that's quite an interesting area where you've got religious freedom on the one hand, some people would argue, versus the freedom not to be harmed by practices like that and to be able to, to, to be yourself and to live your life. Uh, how, how do you, where do you stand on that whole thing? I conflict? cannot understand why any Christian who knows that their religion is about love for others keeps jumping on these landmines. We should love people the way they are. And if they're gay, we need to love them where they are, who they are, or if they're transgender, whatever. We need to love them. And loving them does not include uh, con gay conversion therapy. And, uh, you know, that there is a really radical libertarian article that says you can't ban consensual things like that. But to be honest, we just don't live in that world. So the government wants to ban it. I shall gladly vote to ban it. It's wrong. Okay, that's interesting because Liz Truss seems to be a bit tied up on it at the moment. She doesn't really know quite where she's taking it. But well, I mean, look, there's no getting away from it. In Christianity, people will pray for one another on all sorts of things, and it's important that that is all consensual. But I do what I would say to anyone is that Christianity is not about hating anyone; it's about loving everyone, even your enemies. And so, uh, gay people should be comfortable at church and made to feel loved and welcome. Okay, well, look, we've got to let you go. So let's just do a quick fire round before we finish this podcast. If you had to take counsel from one former British Prime Minister, who would it be? Oh, it's supposed to be quick fire. It'd have to be Margaret Thatcher then. Yeah, I thought you might say that. Um, she had many faults, rather... but Margaret. <laughs> I mean, she was the most successful Conservative Prime Minister of the 21st century, arguably. So um, who would you rather do a trade deal with, President Trump or President Biden? Oh, Trump. Really? Oh, look, you, you didn't ask me who I wanted to have dinner with. 
Don't you think he'd be a tough negotiator, though? Everybody's a tough negotiator. The United States are tough negotiators. I spend a bit of time occasionally talking to the embassy. They're all tough negotiators, but we're great friends. Quite honestly, I think we can do a trade deal with the USA, whoever is president. Um, uh, I wish them both well. Okay. Which song would you walk onto stage to at party conference if you had to do your big conference speech? Fight the power. Right. (laughs) I was just playing that to my staff earlier. Fight the power. Or something by Rage Against the Machine. Excellent. Suggest it might be quite an angry speech, that Steve. But <laughs> <laughs> freedom, freedom by Rage Against the Machine. And don't Where's listen this to the end because they're gone, swearing this at the moderation. End. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. You said this was supposed to be the quick fire funny bit. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. Something, something like that. Um, what would your Downing Street pet be? Lastly, it'd have to be a cat. I love cats. Dogs are great, but cats look after themselves. Okay, excellent. My staff are all looking at me because they want their dog to come in, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> What, is there a campaign to get a, an office dog? We can't have an office dog, unfortunately. Look, don't ask me about this while we're recording. She's looking at me. No, uh, I know the speaker has a dog, but he, there's a thing in Parliament that MPs get away with bringing their dogs in, but not the staff. And now I'm all for equality of treatment, and I'd let the dog come in if I was allowed, but we're not allowed. But there is a campaign to have a dog, yes. Thanks very much for raising it. Oh, you're more than welcome. Um, and would you ever want to be Prime Minister, Steve, do you think? What, if my colleagues prevailed upon me, would I reluctantly allow my name to go forwards? Yeah, is it a dream that you've ever had? Is it something you ever wanted to do? We ask everyone this, I'm not just picking on you. Um, It is not a dream that I have had, but if my colleagues prevailed upon me, I I would reluctantly allow my name name to go forward, yes. If they really twisted your arm, you'd say, all right, yeah, then but do you I'll, know what? I'll yes, be fine. I would. There we go, party popper. You just let off a party popper there. Excellent. We have okay, party well, poppers. Save we, a few my of staff those are now falling eat. about. In my office, we have party poppers to celebrate successes like me confessing that I'd reluctantly allow my name to go forward. So there you go, a bit of fun for the viewer. Well, well, save a few for just in case you do get into Downing Street. I will. <laughs> all right, Steve Baker, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's been really, really interesting to talk to you. All right, thanks very much. Really delighted to be on with you.